Okay, we will get started. Um, welcome everyone and thank you all for joining us today. My name is Rachel Kitsy Collins and I'm an attorney at Lockridge Grindle Nowen and co-president of the Minneapolis St. Paul chapter of the American Constitution Society along with Saraswati Singh. I'd like to thank the other lawyer chapters that are co-hosting this event today, including the Dallas-Fort Worth chapter, the Chicago chapter, the Los Angeles chapter, the Austin chapter, and the Washington DC chapter. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with ACS, we are one of the nation's leading progressive legal organizations, and our mission is to promote the vitality of the Constitution and the fundamental values it expresses, including genuine equality and access to justice. During these unprecedented times, ACS needs your support more than ever. We hope that you will join us as active, engaged members. You can learn more and become a member at acslaw.org. Um, before we begin today, uh, our chapter has another great event coming up on July 29th, um, again over Zoom over the lunch hour, titled Lessons from Ferguson, Building Community Trust with the Police, the Courts, and the Criminal Justice System. Our speaker will be Judge Mark Kappelhoff, who participated in the U.S. Justice Department's civil rights investigation of the Ferguson Police Department before joining the bench. Obviously, this is a very timely topic right now, um, especially given recent events, including the murder of George Floyd at the hands of the police right here in Minneapolis. Um, in addition, please save the date for our 2020 virtual progressive law benefit, which will be on September 24th. I'll now turn it over to our board member, Nur Ibrahim, who will introduce our speakers today. Thank you. Oh, hello. Um, as Rachel mentioned, I'm Noor Ibrahim, and I'm a member um, on the board of directors. And I'm also an associate at Dorsey and Whitney. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. We're glad to be here at this program. We're glad to have all of our great sponsors, including the Hispanic Bar Association and Maple. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing our two speakers. Um, we are joined today by Dana Mitchell, who is an attorney with more than 20 years of legal experience. Ms. Mitchell is an assistant county attorney. In her previous legal experiences, she was an adjunct professor an attorney for the Office of the Monitor, um, um, and she has experience on the landmark civil rights case involving black farmers who sued USDA for discrimination. She earned her MSW and JD from the University of Minnesota in 1996 and 1997 respectively. Ms. Mitchell is a former Bush Fellow. She is the Vice President of Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. She is a volunteer, mentor, an ardent proponent of representation, diversity and inclusion, and sponsor of people and ideas. Ms. Mitchell also believes in the importance of kindness and service to others. We are also lucky to be joined by Aya Helmy, who is an assistant Ramsey County attorney acting as general counsel for four county agencies and defending the county in the administrative and federal litigation. Before working for the Ramsey County Attorney's Office, Ms. Helmy worked in private practice, Washington, D.C. local government, and clerked in Minnesota State Court. She graduated from the William Mitchell College of Law and earned her undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota in political science. Ms. Helmy is an active member of the Minnesota State Bar Association and a former chair of the Hennepin Lawyer Magazine. She also teaches feminist jurisprudence at Mitchell Hamline School of Law in St. Paul and writes about issues of race and gender. Um, if you have any questions throughout the program, please feel free to uh, include your questions in the Q&A box and we'll stop midway to take some of the questions and then we'll also do that again at the end. Now I'll turn it over to our speakers. All right, thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, we're gonna start off talking a little bit about uh, COVID-19 specifically, and I'm sure you're inundated speaking about that and hearing about that, but Unfortunately, we'll be talking a little bit more about it today. Um, so to kind of set the stage for our conversation, we wanted to get on the same page as you uh, discussing COVID itself. So um, we figured we'd talk about how the WHO has, has defined it. Uh, so the WHO has, has declared COVID a pandemic, which is a, a global ec epidemic. It's only named uh, very few epidemics as pandemics in the past, including the so-called Spanish flu of, of 1918, which COVID has been likened to on several occasions, as you I'm sure have heard. Uh, there was a flu in the 1950s, which also was 
um, was uh, likened to the, the current pandemic we're facing. Uh, the H1N1 virus in, in 2009 uh, uh, was also likened to, to the current pandemic that we're facing. So the current pandemic has had quite a steep incline. Uh, and and we, we wanted to kind of show that on the slide here, just to kind of show the impact on society, which obviously has a clear impact on the workplace. And that's what we're here to discuss today is what the impact is on the workplace. But in order to discuss the impact on the workplace, we have to discuss the impact on society. So obviously we're talking about just kind of a snapshot here um, of how things have, have looked both in the US and globally uh, just in the past kind of month and a half, three months, or two and a half months, three months. Uh, we've gone from, uh, I mean, in the US alone, just over a thousand cases and less than 40 deaths to, to actually, I just looked at my phone a few minutes ago and we've actually hit over 4 million cases in, in the US and over 140,000 deaths. So what is COVID? Uh, we know it to be a, an infectious viral disease, uh, not previously found in humans. We know it to be uh, a virus that affects the respiratory and circulatory system and the nervous system. Um, doctors are not sure what else it affects at this point. We know that it's spread through uh, nose and mouth droplets, which is important to know if we're discussing how to control it in the workplace. Um, and that those droplets can be either inhaled by human beings or that they can be transferred by those nose and mouth droplets being transferred onto surfaces and that people can pick those, those nose and mouth droplets off of surfaces and then transfer them to themselves. Um, and it's also important to note if we're going to talk about how to control in the workplace that infected people can spread the disease while asymptomatic. And that research shows that 30 to 45% of people who are infected actually don't show symptoms. And so the CDC and the WHO have guidelines for protection and, and those have been widely discussed. I'm sure you're familiar with them and those include, include social distancing maintaining uh, six feet of distance from others in public, wearing masks, disinfecting frequently touched surfaces, and frequent hand washing. <clears throat> so, uh, like I said before, doctors are still not completely sure how COVID-19 manifests. They, the, the, the manifestation of COVID-19 has varied so severely from person to person, and it's not completely clear what the criteria are for who, um, who is hit by COVID in what way. There are people who are incredibly young and fit and healthy who have um, ended up in comas and have unfortunately died, for example, from COVID. Uh, while there are elderly people who have gotten mild versions of COVID and have survived very easily or have, have even gone to, um, to, to the coma stage or, and survived. Um, and, and also young people who have gotten uh, a very mild version and survived. And there's not really a rhyme or reason to how it, it manifests with people. However, there are certain trends. So what we know based on current information is that um, the risk for severe illness increases with age. The risk for severe illness uh, increases with an underlying condition such as diabetes, uh, heart disease, uh, high blood pressure. Um, the risk for severe illness is higher among pregnant women and the uh, risk for, for illness and death has actually been shown to be higher among Black, Indigenous, and people of color populations. And that's what we're going to focus on today. So let's talk about that. Um, the studies have shown that 
black people are dying two and a half times the rate of white people uh, nationwide. And if you take a look at the numbers that we actually have up on this slide, you can see that uh, Latino people are almost three times, have, have almost three times the, the coronavirus cases as whites, um, just generally. Uh, but if you adjust it for age, and you look at just kind of um, eight, between the ages of 40 and 59, which were kind of essentially adjusting for uh, kind of like working age populations, the data is actually that Latino people are infected at five times the rate as whites. Um, and of the, of the Latinos who have died of the illness, more than a quarter were younger than the age of 60, while among whites, only 6% were that young. And so let's talk about why that is. And you'll see in the material, which um, I believe ACS has posted this material on the uh, event website. Um, so you guys can, can uh, download the PDF of this document so you can have these uh, graphs, which are also um, from the New York Times as well. Um, you'll see from these graphs that it's, it's pretty prevalent that, um, that Black and Latino residents are generally uh, overrepresented in corona uh, cases. And that's nationwide and throughout time. So what we're looking at here is that um, typically kind of like the, the original story and the original theory up front was that, okay, so what we know is that, um, for example, Blacks and Latinos have higher rates of uh, heart disease, have higher rates of, um, of uh, blood pre high blood pressure, diabetes, et cetera. And that's the reason why they, th those populations are uh, more highly affected by corona. However, the studies have actually shown that it's not just that corona is, is leading to more deaths in those populations because of those underlying comorbidities, but those populations are actually, um, uh, actually being more affected by the virus, are contracting the virus more. And so the question is, why are they contracting the virus more? And that goes to the question of the social determinants of health. So the question is, you know, do they, what kind of jobs do they have? Are they um, in jobs where they can work from home or are they in jobs where they in, they're in the service industry, for example? Um, do they take uh, public transportation to work and they're around other people who may, um, may transfer the, vi the virus to them? Are they uh, having to um, go to the grocery store themselves or can they afford to uh, order through Instacart, for example, things like that. There are certain things that um, people who have the means can do versus people who, who cannot. And so um, the studies have showed that, for example, 43% of Black and Latino workers are employed in service or production jobs that can't be done remotely. And so that affects their rate of being able to work from home and stay away from the exposure to corona to, um, to begin with. And that's in comparison to, four, uh, to one in four white workers. So that's, that's almost twice the rate as white workers. And so um, that shows that, that significant imbalance in the number of cases of virus cases in contracting the virus, not just in the comorbidities. Um, and I think that that's really important when we're discussing the, um, the employment issue here, because we're talking about keeping people safe in the workplace. We're talking about uh, uh, accommodating people in the workplace. We're trying to make, make sure that the workplace is safe for everybody, particularly people who may be more likely and more susceptible to this virus. 
So, uh, like I said, um, there are certain people who can work from home and there are certain people who can't work from home. And obviously the, when the, when the, uh, economy shut down and, and, and the world kind of came to a screeching halt a few months ago, the people who couldn't stay home were the essential workers and that those were healthcare practitioners. Those were construction workers, um, people who worked in repair occupations, uh, food prep, uh, workers, personal care assistants, things like that. And nearly half of those essential workers are BIPOC population members. And BIPOC people are overrepresented in food and agriculture, industrial uh, industries, commercial industries, and residential facilities and services. And it's important to note that in es essential workers, um, 70% of them don't have a college degree and 30% have some college or high school diploma. And that matters because when the economy is, is where it's at right now and people are struggling to keep jobs or find jobs, this causes even more of an issue um, for people who are trying to uh, find jobs that'll keep them safe and keep them from having to um, be face to face with people and um, and expose the virus. And so I think these this information that that I'm giving you and and just this kind of baseline of 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 conversation and just kind of this uh, this foundation for our conversation is really important because as we move on to talk about what the EEOC uh, says about discrimination, what it says about accommodations and what we can and cannot do for uh, employees in the workplace, it's important to, say, to see how COVID is affecting employees and who it's actually affecting. Uh, and so I'm gonna hand it over to Dana now to talk to you a little bit more, more about that. Thank you, Aya. So, just some foundational information. So I am an employment lawyer for a governmental entity. And so I, I'm a practitioner and I look at this information from a practitioner point of view and from a progressive point of view. I always believe that if we're going to send employees into the workplace, we have to do safely. And if we can't do it safely, then we shouldn't do it. The, the advice that I give to my, uh, my business units is if, if you're not going to send your most loved uh, person into the workplace um, in that situation, then you shouldn't send that employee into that situation. So we have to be really careful. Uh, we, we know a couple things right now. We know that the job market has shrunk significantly depending on the data that we have right now one in five one in six of jobs have disappeared from the the job market we also know that essential workers have become more essential and we also know that essential workers uh, are disproportionately bipoc um, people and that they are at higher risk for covid now we we covered we covered some material about that and why that's important. What I'm going to cover today is really the intersection of that and the EOC, and the EOC is the Equal Opportunity and Employment Commission, and they are a federal org a federal law enforcement, so to speak, that really oversees uh, discrimination, and they oversee discrimination in the in sense of race, color, religion, gender, sexual orientation, national origin, age, disability, and genetic information. Today, I'm going to cover it only in the sense of disability, but, but please know that they cover it uh, more broadly than that. They also cover only employers with at least 15 um, employees. So if you have fewer than 15 employees, you may not be covered by the EOC. 
They cover all aspects of employment. So that's hiring, firing, promotion, harassment based on disability, training, wages, and benefits. They investigate and they also charge out uh, cases. They're really interested in cases involving systemic discrimination. So, um, and they put out statistics every year around cases. And in my practice, I see a lot of cases are around uh, discrimination based on disability and retaliation. One thing that they are doing right now in this moment, thank goodness they are, is that they're giving some information out on COVID. Um, and we need that. Um, so leadership and guidance on COVID. Um, Aya is going to be my technical assistant on this, and so she's going to bring us to the next slide. So EOC prepared a, a pamphlet, so to speak, um, um, EOC guidance, pandemic preparedness in the workplace and the ADA. And our discussion today is going to borrow very heavily on this um, information that they prepared. This is not new. They actually prepared this during the H1N1 outbreak. They updated it in March of 19, 2020, and they've actually updated multiple times since that. My count is three times, I think even four times since the COVID-19 uh, uh, pandemic. Because what we know is this pandemic has changed in, in innumerable ways that we could not anticipate. Um, we, we thought it was one thing and it's turned into something very, very different. We also know that this pandemic is like nothing we've ever seen before. And it, as Aya has indicated is that, that sometimes, uh, oftentimes people have the, the disease and they're asymptomatic and they're in the workplace. And so we've had to pivot uh, in terms of how as employers and employees we work and what that looks like, particularly when you have a disability. So the ADA protects applicants and employees from disability discrimination. And how it's relevant in terms of a pandemic, it really is in three ways, and that's how I'm gonna cover it today. They regulate disability-related inquiries and medical examinations related to applicants and employees. They prohibit um, a discrimination um, regarding disability in the workplace regarding health and safety um, and direct threat and I'm going to cover that pretty significantly and then the ADA requires reasonable accommodations for individuals with disabilities uh, absent an undue hardship during a pandemic. Um, so we're going to move to the next slide. So before I dive into this next slide I think it's really important to talk about what is a disability. So a disability is not temporary. A cold is not a, temp is, is not a disability. A flu is not a disability. A disability is, is something that is physical or mental that is an impairment that is, is going to be sustained over time. Um, it is something that you, you have a history of it. It is something that uh, you can be regarded as having. So not temporary and it, it, it impacts you in a substantial way. So that's important. You also are disabled if it, it, um, if it impacts um, in you in, in your, your work, in your life, and an employer has an obligation to provide a reasonable accommodation to a qualified disabled person. And so we'll talk a little bit more um, as I go along about what a reasonable accommodation looks like. But that's important background information is that you have to have, be a disabled person and you always have to provide a reasonable accommodation unless it's an undue hardship. So let's move on to disability related inquiry and medical examinations. So normally, right, there are some questions that you can't ask, but for a a pandemic and we're in a pandemic, no question about it. And we will be in a pandemic for some time. So if you're gonna ask a disability related question, you have to, um, you, it, it has to be uh, 
you, you can't ask questions that will elicit information about the disability. So for instance, you can't directly say, do you have cancer? Do you have HIV? That's, pro that's prohibited. But you can ask questions about, do you have a cold or do you have a flu? So that's still the, the guidance that the, uh, that the ADA EEOC provides. We're gonna move on to the next slide. Disability-related inquiries and medical examinations, the, the tests really are that it's medical, if it involves a me medical equipment, if it's invasive, if it's designed to reveal a physical or mental impairment, and if it has to be interpreted by a medical professional. We're gonna move on to the next slide. So when can you do that? So if it's a conditional offer of employment, you can do it after the conditional offer employment, but only if it's universal to all employees. You can't do it before the conditional offer of employment. During employment, you can do it if you have a reasonable basis and objective belief um, if it's gonna impair their ability to do the job. But this is where it's important in terms of our conversation today regarding pandemic. If it's a direct threat, the pandemic is a direct threat. So that's when you can ask medical questions because we know a pandemic is a direct threat. So you can ask employees, do you have COVID? Do you have COVID-like symptoms? What are those COVID-like symptoms? Do you have a cough? Do you have a fever? You know, the fever generally has to be 100.4. Uh, um, have you been around anybody who has COVID or COVID-like symptoms? So that's important. Um, you can ask those questions ordinarily, right? Absent a pandemic, you wouldn't be able to ask those types of questions. We're gonna go to the next slide. So here is what's really important that has not changed. It is the same whether it is pre-COVID or post-COVID. An employer has to make reasonable accommodations. It's going to look different during a pandemic because where people are working and how we're working looks different. So A and I, we're really lucky, right? We, we get to work from home. And so it, it, what I'm gonna need to work from home may, may be the reasonable accommodation. But if I'm an essential worker, what does a reasonable accommodation look like for somebody who is a, a nurse who has to interact with the public? So what is a reasonable accommodation? Right? It's, a, it's something that allows that individual, that worker, the opportunity to continue to perform the essential functions of their job. And it doesn't change what the job is, but it, it allows them to perform that job. So if they can't perform the, the job, then, 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 it's, then they can't do the job. But so here's what I usually say to my, my, um, my clients. Do everything that you possibly can to allow that employer and that employee to continue to work. Engage them. We call that the interactive process. What do you need to do to continue to work? Again, we don't change the essential functions of that job. We just look at how they do that job they're gonna be in the best position to know what that looks like. And we have to be really sensitive to the fact that we're putting people, and, and again, you know, BIPOC communities, older people, in situations that they don't wanna necessarily be in. So what, what would that look like so that they are safe, that we're, that we're addressing their disabilities, so that they can perform the essential functions of the job? They're the experts of their life and we need to engage them. If we can't provide a reasonable accommodation, 
and it opposes an undue hardship, then, then they're not a qualified disabled person. But we, ha we really should do everything we possibly can to accommodate their, their needs. Because we know that this work environment that we find ourselves in is really difficult. Now, one thing that remains the same in terms of a reasonable accommodation is a leave. So if an employee needs a, a leave, we should be able to grant that to them unless it's an undue hardship. If there's only one person doing that job, that may not be, and that may not be reasonable. And we also know that we need to have grace, both in terms of employee and employer under these circumstances, because we're, we're working um, under really difficult circumstances. Our budgets are stretched, you know, oftentimes we have people at home that, that normally aren't going to be at home, you know, more, you know, more kids, we're trying to, you know, teach our kids, you know, animals, all sorts of things. So we really have to have a lot of grace. Just a point of, um, a point of uh, practice here. So under Minnesota law, you're not required to engage in what we call the interactive process. That means sitting down with an employee and asking what they, they need. Under federal law, you are required to engage in the interactive process. I would say always engage in the interactive process. That's going to look different in a pandemic. So is that on you know, using a phone, Zoom, Microsoft, Zoom, Microsoft Teams, whatever that looks like. But engage the employee in whatever form that looks like and ask the employee what they need so they are safe and their needs are met so that they can perform the essential functions of the job, realizing that essential workers are putting their lives at risk more so than anybody else. We're gonna to move to the next slide. Before we go into some questions that you can ask uh, employees during this time, Let's just take a little break and see if there are any questions that we can answer. I think we've got some questions in the chat function. I don't think we have any, so I think we're gonna we're gonna move on. Okay. So this is where we're gonna borrow um, from the the guidance, um, and this is taken directly from the. EOC where you can ask these questions where normally you wouldn't be able to ask these questions because they are eliciting uh, answers that may indicate somebody's health status and so um, this is a, a, a question that it, it's a compound question and so it's not necessarily telling you uh, whether or not you have kids or you have uh, a, a, a certain condition or you've traveled, but it's putting it all together and just asking you to answer that question. So this is a permissible question that you can ask an employee during a pandemic. I would not suggest that you ask this question absent a pandemic. Again, we borrowed this question from the guidance from the EOC. We're gonna move on to the next question. Again, another permissible question that you can ask during a pandemic. And um, ADA covered, again, um, ADA covered is important because not every employee is covered by the ADA. And this really is about information uh, about health status. So practice point, if you are asking questions about somebody's health status, I work for a government entity, and so if I'm asking an employee information, I have to give them a what's called a Tennyson warning or privacy notice. That's really important to provide that to them before I ask that information. I have to let them know that I'm asking them, why I'm asking them, who I can share that with, uh, and where, uh, where I'm going to be putting that information. And when you get that information, it's really important that you put that in a confidential medical file 
separate from a personnel file. And that's really important. The EEOC really stresses that you keep any medical information that you get from an employee separate from any personnel file. That is a big no-no to, to uh, put those two together. So if you're gonna ask questions, medical questions, keep them separate. Also, if you're going to be taking temperatures, which you can do during a pandemic, which you normally cannot do, practice point. Try to take, take temperatures or have the employee take their own temperature out of the earshot and a, a view of other employees. Again, that's health information, and we don't want other employees to have access or view of other people's health information. That's permissible during a pandemic, would not be permissible outside of the pandemic. Asking about their, their wellness, asking about their symptoms, permissible, keep it confidential. And I would also say if you are gonna be taking or asking employees to take their own temperature, only maintain that data if their temperatures are such that it indicates that they have COVID symptoms. Otherwise, you're gonna be keeping a lot of data about an employee that you don't need to maintain. We're gonna move on to the next slide. Travel, that's really tricky. So most employers have canceled all travel, right? Life is canceled for 2020, right? But no travel for you. Most of the, the travel that is gonna be taking place is really for personal travel, to see family, whether it's because if it's an emergency or leisure travel but that exposes you to COVID-19. An employer can ask about an employee's travel because that can create a direct threat to the workplace. So they can ask uh, about their, their travel and an employee can also voluntarily disclose th that information. The same, uh, same issues apply that when you are asking those questions about an employee's travel, make sure that you ask it outside of the view of other employees and that you keep that information separate in a separate medical file from their personnel information. But we know that not everyone is going to shelter from home, that they are going to venture outside of their home because we know that this pandemic is not gonna go away anytime soon and life happens and people are gonna tr travel for a variety of reasons and it is gonna impact the workplace. We're gonna move on to the next slide. So more questions that you, more things that we can, we can ask and we can do. So employers should encourage employees to telework. And, and that was something that was encouraged at the very beginning of this pandemic. But as AIA covered, not everyone is so lucky to be able to telework. And again, BIPOC communities, essential workers uh, aren't able to telework. So there are certain, you know, certain things that employers can ask and also demand of em employees, right? They can uh, demand that they wear face masks in Minnesota. And I think some, most of you are from Minnesota, but some of you are not. We now have a mandate that you wear face masks. We can mandate hand washing. We can uh, discuss other hygiene and we can mandate uh, PPE. Um, we can uh, also, if, and I think we covered this too, if you, we make a conditional offer of employment, but then you uh, have COVID or COVID symptoms after conditional offer, we can withdraw that, that offer. Um, that's different than what would have happened before COVID. So um, again, things have really, COVID has really changed the way in which we can ask employees questions because we know that COVID is a direct threat to employees in the workplace and, uh, and it is allowed under the ADA. 
we're going to move to the next slide. Covered this a little bit before, but we can delay start times. We can withdraw. Um, we can withdraw uh, conditional offers, and we can send employees home who have COVID or COVID symptoms and require a doctor's note before we have them come back to the workplace because of the direct threat that COVID has on the workplace. And, and this is allowed under the ADA. Next slide. So some things that you can't do. You can't discriminate against employee, employees because they're pregnant or older or people of color or because they're particularly vulnerable to COVID. But you can certainly work with uh, employees uh, around that, but you can't discriminate. Uh, you can't discriminate against employees that uh, and ask if they're asymptomatic, right? You know, you have to be, you have to color within the lines. You can't compel employees to take a vaccine. Right? There are certain employees that can't take it because of medical reasons, and there are certain employees that uh, won't take it because of sincerely held religious beliefs. You certainly can encourage employees to take it, a vaccine, but we know that not all employees are going to take a vaccine, and so. We, as we look at COVID and the, the lifespan of COVID, this may be with us for some time. And so how we navigate COVID and the EOC uh, is, going to, is going to be with us for a while. Safety is going to be paramount for our employees and particularly for our essential workers and for our um, for BIPOC populations. Next slide, please. So what we should always consider are reasonable accommodations. And I, and I touched on that bef before, but we can never deny an employee a reasonable accommodation unless, of course, it's an undue hardship. An undue hardship um, really does have to be an undue hardship. It has to be disruptive to the business operations, and it, it, it really does have to be something that truly, not impossible, but just so extraordinarily difficult that you just can't do it. We, we do know that people's employees' budgets are, are stretched right now. We know that people are working in different places right now, but my sense is that the EEOC will never move away from this requirement that reasonable, uh, reasonable um, accommodations really does mean that, that you have to be focused on trying to meet the needs of employees in this moment, uh, and that won't change uh, with COVID, thankfully. We're gonna move to the next slide. So we covered this a little bit, but you know, disability is substantial. It limits the condition. It's not temporary. We always want to meet the needs. It's a case by case uh, analysis of the needs of an employee. So what one employee needs is not going to be the same as what another employee needs. And so you look at that individual always. So if an essential worker uh, is able to work from home and, and see if you can reimagine what that work looks like, changes in schedules, uh, duties, leave of absence, and never forget leave of absence as a reasonable accommodation. But we have to think very creatively in this time of COVID. We're gonna move to the next slide. Okay, so where are we? Where, how, how does this all end? We don't know. But what we do know is that employees uh, have a right to a safe working environment. They have a right to be uh, 
protected. They have a right not to be discriminated against based on their disability. There are other laws that protect them. We mentioned a few here, the FMLA, FFCAR, FLSA, and OSHA. Um, we also know that, that guidance from uh, health authorities are going to change over time. We know that guidance probably from the CDC is going to change over time. And so as long as an employer uh, follows the guidance of the CDC, that they will be protected. So you have to really attend to what that looks like. Um, and I know that A and I look at this probably two or three times a week so that we really are giving the best advice that we possibly can to our, our business units, but we are really employee centric in giving that advice, knowing that our employees are really literally putting their lives at risk and providing these essential services to clients and the public. One thing that has not been answered that I don't think will be answered is, is COVID-19 a disability? The EOC hasn't answered that. But what we do know that COVID-19 can be a disability. So many people are getting sick from COVID-19 and are developing chronic conditions as a result of COVID-19. And, and of course, we know people are losing their lives because of COVID-19. So we need to proceed cautiously and carefully and safely. So thank you for your time. We want you to be safe and we'll be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. That was really wonderful. Uh, my name is Saraswati Singh. I'm co-president of ACS along with Rachel Kitsi Collins, who you saw earlier. Um, I'm doing the Q&A portion. Um, and we actually have a question from the audience. Please keep them coming, guys. Um, the first question is, I have a client who is a massage therapist. Employees are required to take 15 minutes between each client to sanitize their workspaces. The employer is, in, is refusing to pay them for that time. Is that legal? Well, you know, I don't think it's legal because that's really what is required to keep to, for it to be safe for the, the client. That's part of the work. So I wouldn't, I don't think that would be, I don't think that's legal to not to pay the employer, the employee to do that work. I think that they would need to be paid for that. What are some resources they can look at? Should they go to the EEOC website? Now, or? I, I think they should look at the Department of Labor for some guidance on that, because that looks more like a Department of Labor issue than an EOC issue. I agree. Also, I mean, if they're if they're an, an employee, um, I think that that analysis is correct. I would also know that a lot of massage therapists are contract. Right. Based, so I think that would be a different analysis. So it just depends, too. Um, I don't see any other questions yet, so I'll ask my own. Um, so I'm originally from New York City and my parents are still there and Dana knows this because I called her crying. Um, my mom got COVID. She works at a nursing home and um, a huge portion of the residents there uh, passed away within a month. Um, what do you do when your loved one has COVID? What are, what are some options? Could you just give us some practical to do's because um, you never think it's going to happen until it happens. And then, you know, your mom or someone who's always been strong is weak um, and doesn't know how to navigate, like, the legal aspect of things. Well, I always start with asking the question, what you need, you know, on a personal level, right? You know, what you need. So if that's your loved one, you ask your loved one what you need. Uh, from, if they're working, you encourage them to ask their employer what kind of work policies and leave policies do you have available for me? You know, there were a number of, uh, of federal laws that were passed uh, initially that gave leave to 
certain workers and a lot of employers also gave certain additional leave to empl employees as well. Unfortunately, some of the federal laws exempted essential workers from those from that those leave policies but it always i would always ask because they were supposed to make decisions on a case by case basis so always ask for whatever leave policy is available you know, to be able to travel to go see your loved one isn't always possible because it puts you at, at risk, right, when you travel from one place to a, another. But sometimes you just feel like you need to do so and you're gonna do so. Um, but then come back and quarantine. Let your employer know that you travel to a place in which you, you may have been exposed to COVID and ask for the ability to to work from home if at all possible, uh, use you know whatever leave policies are available to you. But we we will all come into contact, I believe, with somebody who has been exposed to COVID-19. We know that the duration of COVID-19 is going to be long and it's going to be difficult. And so I'm a firm believer is if you don't ask, you don't get, and we should ask for what we need because we're a whole people and uh, we're going to be impacted by this there's there's no way out of this and it's not a two it's not a two weeks and done for a lot of for a lot of people we know that there are a lot of people develop chronic illness as a result of this and so you may be able to use uh, you know you may need reasonable accommodations as a result of the illnesses, illness that you develop as a result of, of, of COVID. There may be FMLA available to you as a result of, of that, like for you or that loved one. So a number of different federal laws that are available to you, uh, whether you have it or a loved one has it. Thank you so much. Um, we have another question, and then if, and then I'll announce the CLE code at the very end, the cherry on top. Um, okay, the next question. Given the disparities that were covered, especially at the beginning of the presentation, what insights and opinions do you have regarding school openings during the pandemic, and how that may disproportionately impact BIPOC employees in schools? And this question is from Angie Porter. Well, hi, Angie. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm of, I'm of two opinions because I know that students of color are gonna be disproportionately impacted if they are distance learn. But I also know that if they go to school and they bring it home, that their families are gonna be disproportionately impacted. I don't think that there's any way to really um, get through this in a, in a good way. I, I, personally, I, I, I'd like to see us get through this illness, this disease, and then get kids and, and workers back. But I think we have to get through this illness. And that means that we just hunker down, we put on our masks, we keep everyone home that we possibly can, and then we get back to work and school. But when we prolong things by, uh, by not wearing masks, by having people in the community um, that don't need to be there, things are a little bit difficult. Um, I, I worry about essential workers being exposed. Um, so I, I, I don't think that there's an easy answer and I think it's, it's so complex. And I think every family has to make the decision that is best for them. A, a, how would you answer that question? So um, I think that the COVID pandemic has essentially cast into stark relief all the cracks that have already existed in our society. Um, and that that was very obvious uh, 
based on all the disparities that that we saw in that first part of the presentation you know and and that that carries over into that school question you know and so i don't think that the school question can be answered without uh, addressing the disparities that already exist in the school system and so we have those disparities that exist currently we we have um schools that majority BIPOC kids go to that are severely underfunded, that are overpopulated, that where where teachers don't have the um don't have the the resources that they actually need to to do what they what they need to do. Um, and that's gonna that I mean that's gonna carry over into how they respond to COVID, right? So like if if the schools with like all the resources in the world aren't able to fix what they, I mean, to do what they need to do to respond to COVID, how are these schools going to do that? You know, I mean, so I, so I mean, that's, that's like the base layer of, of this question. And, and I think, you know, Dana, you bring up a really important point where, you know, one question, one question is, or one issue is that, um, BIPOC kids uh, who are who are home or who are distance learning right now are are at a disadvantage, but they're also at a disadvantage when they're when they're going to school and bringing back potentially COVID, right? And and they're exposing their BIPOC parents who are already vulnerable to this disease um, to COVID. And so there's this kind of like you know, to use a slang term, like a cluster, essentially, that's like, you know, potentially going to happen here. And, and there's, unless we, you know, our, our policymakers are very deliberate and, and, you know, understand what is possibly going to occur here and pour resources into it, I don't really see how you can address that. But I think, you know, it just comes back to the fact that there already are these disparities and they're the only the only way to address that is to address the disparities. Right. I think I think you have to address the public health aspect of it and you have to go deep and you can't be unequivocal. Thank you. We have one final question and we only have about a minute or so. OK. Final question, what should you do slash what are your options if your employer wants you to show up in person for meetings slash work that could be done virtually and you prefer to work from home to be safer? Well, I would absolutely say is, is this something that can be done virtually? And if so, I, I'm going to attend virtually. Because part of trying to make sure that COVID doesn't spread is to have people work virtually. That's what we, we talked about at the very beginning. That was, you know, we're in Minnesota. So uh, our governor said, if you can work from home, you should. That principle has not uh, abated in any way. So I would I would press upon that employer, if this work can continue to be done from home, it should. So is this work that can be done from home? Then let's do this work from home. I understand that you would like for us to be in person, but like versus, you know, can, you know, like versus should is very different. I, I, we don't want to spread the disease. That to me is a vehicle for spreading the disease. I haven't physically been in my office since March. There is no need for me to be physically in my office. The work can be done from, I work in my she shed, right? Uh, I don't have to be in an office to get this work done. So I would just press upon this employer to continue to do the work from home if it if at all possibly can be done from home. Aya, do you have any thoughts on that? No, I mean I think that that's I mean I think employers need to be to be um, you know I think that employers were very hesitant to move to remote work because they were concerned about people staying remote. 
And I think that there are employers that are, you know, starting to push people back into the office ever so carefully um, uh, by just kind of pressuring them into going back into the office like, oh, you know, we're going to have this meeting. You might as well come in kind of thing. Um, and I think that employees should should push back a little bit on on that. And 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 I don't think employers can can mandate at this point, given where we're at, uh, uh, to, for it employees. To be safe. Yeah. Right, it needs to be safe. And what does that look like? How, how are they going to guarantee a safe working environment? Yeah. Right, right. And they can, so, you know. Right. And then um, I'm gonna give you 10 seconds each to answer this. Final, final question. Uh, Bridget Mason says, in Minnesota, isn't it a violation of the existing executive order to require an employee who can work from home to work from home? Not exactly. It, it's encouraged. If you can work from home, you should be able to, an employer should require, it should work from home. So it's not a, it should, it's, it, it, it should, it's not a shall, it's a should. And A is nodding along. Well, with that, I want to thank both of our wonderful speakers, Dana Mitchell. You're just a wonderful person. You did a great job today. Thank you for coming and speaking to us. And Aya Helmy, uh, another wonderful person. We're so lucky to have her, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office. Um, thank you for focusing on um, this pandemic and really who it's affecting the most. Um, we all share this world together and we're, we can all spread this disease together. And so whatever we can do to um, do the best that we can and help each other, that's how we're gonna get out of it. It's gonna require working together. So with that, I'm gonna give you, drum roll please, the CLE code. It's 315-111, 315-111. And with that, we're done. Thank you so much for joining us for this ACS event. And we hope to see you next week for a Ferguson one. Thanks. Be safe. Thanks, everyone.